Hi, I'm Steve Clemens, and I have a couple of questions. Have relations between Russia and the United States reached real rock bottom? Can they improve? Or will things get even worse? Let's get to the bottom line. U.S. President Joe Biden openly says he believes his Russian counterpart, President Vladimir Putin, is a soulless killer. The Biden-Putin relationship is less of a love fest compared to what Donald Trump and Putin had, but that doesn't mean Biden and Putin won't be working together. Both sides are now testing each other's red lines. Ukraine is one of those contests, but so too is cyberspace. After Washington determined that the Russian government was behind a huge hacking of its agencies that started in 2019, known as the Solar Winds hack, the Biden administration sanctioned dozens of organizations and individuals in Russia and kicked out 10 Russian diplomats. Russia responded by telling the U.S. ambassador in Moscow that it's probably a good idea for him to take a vacation in America for a while. Tit for tat, knuckle wrapping aside, Biden has invited Putin to a face to face personal summit meeting in a third country sometime this summer to reset relations. But in the era of Biden and the ongoing story of Vladimir Putin, what kind of cooperation or competition is normal for these two countries? Today we're talking with someone who's been one of the keenest observers of Russia U.S. relations for decades. Dmitry Symes is an author and professor on Soviet and Russian studies and an expert in geostrategic affairs. He's met with Putin and he's advised American presidents on relations with each other. And he's the president and CEO of the Center for the National Interest and publisher of the foreign policy focused journal, The National Interest. Dmitry Symes, it's great to have you on the show today. Let me just ask you, as we have now moved into uh, an inflection point politically, at least in the United States, and as both countries are sort of trying to figure out how to manage their equities, their interests, I know uh, you have a very realist lens of how to get that right. What do you think is most important right now for Joe Biden to try and accomplish with Vladimir Putin? I think the first thing that is most important uh, is uh, obviously to protect uh, American geopolitical interests and to do it in a way that would not risk nuclear war. Uh, that's uh, uh, fairly simple in principle. Uh, it's not very easy to accomplish because uh, if you are paralyzed by fear of war, uh, you would allow uh, Russia uh, the upper hand. Uh, and if you are so eager to prevail in every instance uh, that you forget about nuclear weapons, well, then you can invite disaster. So it's quite a challenge uh, to find the right balance. You know, one of the things you wrote recently in the national interest is the United States had to decide whether it wanted to be a hegemonic democratic empire uh, that prevented anyone else from basically having a say in the world, or whether it had to recognize its constraints, uh, live within those, and allow other nations uh, to, to do that. Where do you think the U.S. is going right now with that calculation? Well, uh, rhetorically, of course, uh uh, we're talking about the United States uh, not just being number one, but clearly being uh, the leader of uh, uh, the free world, and the free world is supposed to dominate the rest of the world. We present uh, uh, this competition with Russia as an ideological struggle. Uh, it's almost like uh, uh, history has reversed itself. Uh, Brezhnev was talking about ideological struggle about uh, uh, an imminent uh, victory of uh, the Soviet Union as the leader of socialism. And now we're talking about the United States being uh, uh, the leader of democracies and, again, uh, being bound to succeed. But if you look not at rhetoric, but at what is really happening, uh, you can see that uh, the United States and Russia are quite suspicious of each other, uh, that uh, the United States and Russia obviously have different interests and very different values. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, both nations realize that nuclear war is not a sensible option, that brinksmanship is too dangerous, and accordingly it is important to identify areas where we can cooperate, uh, if for no other reason, because we need to manage our differences. You know, one of the things that I've been trying to understand, Dmitry, uh, is how Russians inside Russia look at their leadership, look at their choices, look at what's happened with Ukraine, look at what's happening with Alexei Navalny. And I, and I, and I think it's fair to say that 
you know, domestic support for Vladimir Putin's actions in Russia is rather high. And a lot of us looking are just very surprised by that. And I know you've been to Russia recently. What is your sense of Putin's popularity and Putin's choices? Are they rooted in domestic support in Russia? Well, first of all, Putin's popularity has clearly declined. It has declined with Russian living standards. Uh, it has declined with uh, Russian difficulty in dealing with the pandemic. Uh, and it has declined with uh, very few foreign policy successes during recent years. Uh, but uh, uh, it has declined in comparison uh, with being very high, let's say, in 2014, when the Russians took over Crimea. And at that time, Putin's popularity was 83 wow. percent. Now it's wow. much lower, but it's still 62 percent, which obviously is high. And you may ask, how can we trust uh, uh, these opinion polls? Well, I will tell you, I am quoting the Levada poll, which belongs to the opposition. The Russian government considers this polling organization uh, a foreign agent. And uh, I think most Russian opposition leaders take Levada reports very seriously. So Putin is sufficiently popular at home not to be so worried about domestic support in his uh, dealings with the United States. And I also have to say that the more Russia is pressured, the more Russia is lectured, the greater Putin's support is. Because the majority of Russians, even those who are uh, quite uneasy with the quality of Putin's leadership, they are patriotic people, and they don't like when foreign powers tell Moscow what to do. Mm. Let's listen to a clip of President Biden and some of his early comments on dealing with Russia. The United States is not looking to kick off a cycle of, ex of escalation and conflict with Russia. We want a stable, predictable relationship. <clears throat> if Russia continues to interfere with our democracy, I'm prepared to take further actions to respond. Dimitri, do you think that message from uh, President Biden is one that is welcomed uh, in Moscow and in the Kremlin, or is it one that is saying we're going to have a rocky relationship? How do you think they're hearing the President of the United States? Uh, Steve, as you know, <coughs> I co-host a political talk show in Moscow, which is called The Great Game. Mm. Uh, mm. And uh, uh, last Thursday, uh, we interviewed Putin's press secretary, Dmitry Peskov, who actually is also a deputy chief of the presidential administration. Mm. And I have asked uh, Peskov at the end of our conversation, uh, what would be one thing uh, he thinks, he believes, the Biden administration should know about Russian position? What would allow Russia to accept the summit uh, with President Biden, which the U.S. president has recently proposed, and there was still no response from Putin? And Peskov said, he thought for a second, he paused, and he said, well, uh, President Biden said that he is interested in avoiding escalation and cooperating with Russia uh, where it is possible. But he said the problem is that whenever uh, the Biden administration makes a statement like that, there is immediately, but, but we still would do this to Russia. We would force Russia to pay a price uh, if uh, uh, they don't follow uh, American guidance. And uh, from Moscow's standpoint, that is not a way to talk with Russia. And the problem is, indeed, that uh, uh, being tough with Russia rhetorically may be very popular in the United States domestically. But it doesn't make Putin more flexible. Mm. Quite the contrary. He takes great pride on never surrendering under foreign pressure. And it helps him domestically. So uh, unwittingly, President Biden, by being inflexible rhetorically, is helping Putin domestically. When you talk about respect and the, and, the, and the posture that America should take in dealing with a powerful Russia, I'm interested in this, this because it's not something that's often discussed. Do you think if the U.S. were to become more self-aware of some of that, that you would find a more um, uh, uh, workable, pliable you know, Russian participation in trying to solve some of these problems, say, in Ukraine with Crimea? 
Well, Steve, being polite with Russia is obviously not a panacea. Right. You have always uh, to negotiate from a position of strength, if you have strengths, and particularly the U.S. agenda is sufficiently ambitious. That would be totally unrealistic to pursue it if the United States would not be strong, would be strong economically, uh, would be strong in terms of domestic unity, and uh, strong in terms of American alliances, and, of course, strong militarily. Having said that, if you are really strong and self-confident, you don't need to put your opponents down. Mm. Uh, you uh, demonstrate to them your strengths. You demonstrate to them your force of conviction. But then uh, you remember that they have their own dignity. And they may be bad people, or we may feel that they are wrong, that they are very disagreeable. But at the same time, if we do not have uh, power to intimidate them, we need to negotiate with them. And uh, uh, if you negotiate with somebody, putting them down and insulting their leaders is really not a very good thing to do. Hmm. I don't need to tell you Ronald Reagan uh, was tough as nails in dealing with the Soviet Union. I am not aware of a single instance when Reagan was personally attacking Soviet leaders. And that was not, again, because he was soft on communism, but because he wanted to have results rather than domestic grandstanding. What are Russia's options strategically? Does, does Russia really have an option of embedding itself more closely with China? I know it has, uh, has troops in an alliance with Syria. It has troops in Libya. Uh, what are the elements with Iran, perhaps? Does it help give Iran sort of a sideways move in dealing with the U.S. and things that, that it was party to, like the JCPOA? What are the elements of the sort of great, you know, uh, chessboard out there that would give Russia strategic depth and options that would help maneuver around the United States? Well, Russian options in that regard, in terms of building strong alliances, are not particularly good. Actually, uh, I will refer again to my interview last week with Putin's press secretary, Dmitry Peskov, and I addressed that very question to him. Uh, and I said that uh, Russia has good relations with a number of important countries, starting, of course, with China. Mm. But Russia mm. doesn't seem to have real allies. Uh, U.S. allies are expelling uh, Russian diplomats as a sign of solidarity with the United States and with the Czech Republic. Not a single country is expelling American or European diplomats to support Russia. And they asked, is there a possibility uh, that Russia and China would become allies if they are subjected to strong American pressure? And they got a very interesting response. Uh, 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 instead of saying, well, uh, we're great friends with China and uh, this uh, cooperation is only getting stronger every day and can result in a formal military alliance. Instead, Mr. Peskov said, uh, uh, the United States and Russia have very different concept of alliances. In the Russian case, alliances are to help people of both countries to uh, contribute to their security and prosperity. They are not directed against anybody else, and we are not looking for formal security arrangements with any other countries. Now, uh, you, you have to understand that this is uh, a very meaningful statement, not because I necessarily uh, take it literally, uh, but because it indicates uh, that uh, Moscow does not expect an alliance with China anytime soon. Uh, the Chinese and the Russians have similar grievances against the United States. They want to work clo closely together, but Russia does not want uh, to go to uh, war or even military confrontation uh, with the United States because of China. And the same is sadly true with the Chinese. The Iranian former foreign minister, Javad Zarif, uh, recently shared his perspective on Russia, and he complained that they were playing their own game and really did not want to even to promote uh, nuclear agreement, nuclear disarmament agreement, to which they officially are a party. So uh, Russia does not have strong alliances like the United States, and building such alliances is not in the cards. But I do think uh, that if uh, we uh, in the United States 
are not careful, we can create some kind of ad hoc, temporary arrangements between China and Russia, which would not be quite an alliance. But you know, there was no alliance between Hitler and Stalin. But uh, uh, arrangements these two countries made helped them to start World War II. We have to be very careful not to repeat the situation in the nuclear age. You know, Dmitry, a lot of people uh, frame Russia as a, you know, moderate or even a small economy. They may look at it as an oil and gas superpower. But I, I know that Russia has the ability to destroy the United States and has more deployed nuclear warheads than any other nation on Earth. And I think it's something that's forgotten. But another element of power out in the world um, exists in what nations can do and muster in the cyber world. And we've had a lot of debate in this country about what Russia has done meddling in the elections. And I'm just sort of interested in your insights into this new arena of information uh, disinformation, which, which, as you've written, Russia um, has particular expertise in. But in this new world of cyber, does this give Russia another dimension of power that uh, much of the world is underestimating? Well, Steve, first, I would not underestimate Russian economic power. They're, of course, uh, not in the same league with the United States. Hmm. Uh, uh, not at all. Having said that, if you look at the purchasing power, they are number six in the world. They are number two in Europe, just after Germany. Mm. They are economically, uh, I would say, a very troubled country in many respects, but they are still a major economic presence. Now, if you look at the Russian military budget, uh, uh, official figures suggest uh, something in the range of $70 billion. I don't think that anybody takes it seriously. Mm. If you again look uh, in terms of purchasing power, and this is a much more meaningful figure, uh, the Russian uh, uh, military budget is in the range of 140, 150 billion dollars. That's a very, very serious number, uh, particularly for a country where uh, uh, the manpower is much cheaper than uh, in the United States, mm. when they, they don't spend the same money on uh, uh, pensions uh, for the veterans as in the United States. In terms of cyber, it's difficult for me to judge. I'm not really an expert in that area. Mm. Uh, the official line in the Kremlin is that they are doing very well, that they are among world leaders in that area. Of course, there is an alternative opinion that many of the best Russian uh, scientists are immigrating, and you can find them in the Silicon Valley in California uh, rather than uh, in some uh, scientific center close to Moscow. It is suffice to say, however, again, I don't know uh, uh, how to compare them with the United States. I assume they are considerably behind, but they do have capabilities which can be very meaningful if there are serious military confrontations. And I don't think that anybody wants to experiment in that area, particularly because you never know when cyber warfare can lead to a, a, an actual warfare and even military confrontation. Do you think sort of among the strategic class in Washington that nuclear weapons and their prevalence have become kind of, you know, banal, that people don't think about them anymore? Because I am interested in how little folks think about the nuclear possibilities um, in, a, in a negative encounter with Russia? Uh, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, it started, I think, uh, in a big way during the Obama administration, hmm. when President Obama could not believe uh, that anybody in his right mind would think about using nuclear weapons in any kind of confrontation. Well, of course, uh, the Russian military doctrine uh, uh, says very clearly that if Mother Russia is in danger, even when they are not actually attacked with nuclear weapons, they would consider using nuclear weapon. And Putin said very graphically, if uh, we have a situation when Russia is in danger or when Russia may be destroyed, well, uh, who wants the world without Russia? Mm. Maybe if they do it to us, uh, the world shouldn't even exist. He said it obviously semi-sarcastically, uh, but there was, I think, uh, an element of truth uh, in terms of reflecting uh, their real approach. I also have to say uh, that uh, Putin, uh, he has a somewhat important background 
in terms of avoiding nuclear war. Uh, he, of course, was born after the war, uh, but uh, his uh, parents, uh, they were in St. Petersburg. Now, at that time, it was called Leningrad during the blockade, when uh, about a million people died in Leningrad. Among them was Putin's young brother. So uh, for Putin, a possibility of a major war, this is a kind of reality which colors his approach to major confrontation with the United States, which is, mm. in my view, really eager to avoid. But there are a lot of people a little younger mm. without any real experience in World War II. And they are much more cavalier than Putin himself, suggesting all kinds of military retaliations against what they believe is American hegemony. Right. Uh, Putin is an autocrat. Putin is a Russian nationalist, but uh, <clears throat> he is a pragmatic former intelligence officer. He is not uh, like, you know, a cavalry general who wants uh, too much forward no matter what. But there are people in Russia mm -hmm. uh, who have a, a much more, what I would say, assertive, uh, less cautious approach to military situations, to military relations with the United States. Let me just ask you finally, Dmitry. Um, President Biden has made an offer to uh, President Putin to meet him sometime this summer for a one on one personal summit. I've read in Russia, uh, in the Russian press, that they don't want a repeat of Helsinki in 2018. They don't want uh, a do nothing summit that ends up looking like a clown show, basically. They want something serious. If you were helped to, to, to identify the most important elements of an agenda that these two leaders would find worth their equities at home, what would those be? What would you put on the table to advise President Biden uh, as a way of saying, here is a way to make this more serious than not in terms of bringing Vladimir Putin into a consequential dialogue? Well, uh, climate change is one area where Russia and the United States have a lot in common. I think nuclear proliferation, mm. including uh, obviously the case of North Korea, again, there is considerable agreement. And I would say crisis management, strategic stability, where actually I think one of the best areas of cooperation between the United States and Russia is the relationship between two militaries. They obviously disagree. Mm. Obviously, consider uh, each other rivals, but they do know how to work together and to manage situation. Beyond that, uh, we have one uh, great dividing line, and this is Ukraine. Uh, the United States, particularly uh, under Biden, has adopted Ukraine mm. as a, a, a de facto ally. And uh, look at the situation between Russia and Ukraine uh, as black and white with uh, the United States accepting that Ukraine is a victim of aggression, uh, Russia is uh, an aggressor, and they basically adopted a Ukrainian view uh, that uh, Ukraine, if you wish, is the best against uh, further Russian aggression in Europe. For the Russians, mm. Ukraine is an existential issue. They do believe that there was a military coup d'etat in Ukraine back in uh, 2014. Hmm. They do believe that it happened with considerable assistance from the United States. And only after that, Russia took over Crimea and supported the separatists. It's very difficult hmm. uh, to have any agreement on Ukraine if uh, uh, neither side is willing to compromise and to understand that this situation is not black and white. Well, Dmitry Symes, president and CEO of the Center for the National Interest, I really appreciate your candid thoughts. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. So what's the bottom line? Everything that Washington doesn't like about Russia is exactly what makes Putin more popular. Invading Ukraine and annexing Crimea? Well, that's super popular in Russia. Doing away with term limits and basically keeping Putin in as president for life or at least the next 15 years. That's super popular in Russia. Even trying to kill his critic, Alexei Navalny, throwing him in jail. Half of Russians say it's his own fault for criticizing Putin. And don't forget, all opinion polls in Russia say that folks there see the United States as their number one enemy. So Putin stays popular as long as he finds new ways to poke America, whether by hacking or by social media campaigns, to mess with American society. 
What incentive does he have to play nice with Biden? So let's keep it real. As my guest today would have it, America's going to have to figure out a way to live in cold peace with Moscow, warmer than the days of the Cold War, but not warm and friendly. And that's the bottom line.